Akhenaten's Gates, Chapter 29 Akhenaten let out a deep sigh. I turned over on the bed and began to rub his back. You've been restless for a while now. What's bothering you? Indeed, for a couple of weeks, Akhenaten seemed to suffer from a horrible case of insomnia. Something was on his mind. Something was bothering him, and it was stealing his sleep from him. If he didn't tell me soon, forget insomnia and insanity. I was just going to have to smother him myself. It's nothing, he replied. Tell me or I'll push you out of bed and make you sleep on the floor like a dog, I threatened. You would push me out of my own bed? You're driving me crazy with your tossing and turning all night long. And you whine too much if I sleep in my bed. What's wrong? It's nothing, Nefertiti, he insisted. I just had a lot of things on my mind. That's obvious, I replied. After a brief pause, I placed my hands on his back again and pushed. This sent him tumbling to the floor in a seriously confused stupor. Nefertiti! I told you, I sighed, sprawling out on the bed. Now, if you want to get back in, you'll have to tell me what's bothering you. You really are something else, he sighed. Very well. I'm worried about her. Her? Oh, her. Why? I don't want her to come, Nefertiti. I have a strange and bad feeling about it deep in my gut. Austin is trying to tell me something, but I can't quite understand what it is. But I cannot go back on my word. What will I do? I was silent, contemplating his words. It certainly was a horrible situation to be in. No wonder he had been so nervous beside me. Was he afraid that I would lash out? Well, all we can do is pray, Akhenaten. I know. And make passionate love. Yeah, but... What? Okay, that got his attention. How could you be feeling all passionate after talking about her? She will only be a problem for us if you have no son. If you want a son, that means I must get pregnant again. To do that... We need to make love. You really scare me sometimes, he whined. <laughs> You're afraid of me? Very, he muttered. From time to time, I can see my mother in you. Sometimes it makes it very hard for me to relax. I could only laugh. Oh, Akhenaten, there you are. There's that adorable, shy little boy I first met. Do you remember your own words? Is not that what you wanted? You wanted a woman like your mother, and she has taught me well. That she has. So? So? So, I persisted, get in the bed and do your job. Know your role and perform well. <laughs> he crawled nervously back into bed with a mutter. What am I? A dog? Well, if that's what working for your groove right now, then go for it, I teased. Working my what? You're talking funny again, Nefertiti. Akhenaten. Yes? Just shut up and let's go. Okay, so it wasn't exactly the most romantic of our lovemaking endeavors, but don't think it was any less meaningful. And it was certainly no less fun. It was rather nice, giving the old jealousy rough and tumble a try. Yes, I was most certainly jealous. The very thought of that little girl was enough to make me want to yank out my hair in clumps. Akhenaten was mine. Akhenaten was my husband. And Akhenaten was spent. Are you going to be all right? I asked. He panted, trying hard to catch his breath, and sat up so as not to rudely fall asleep before I was finished talking. Nefertiti. Uh-oh. Here it comes, I chuckled. Anything that I could possibly give you, it's all yours. You are my everything. You will always remain the most exquisite queen, most exquisite woman in all of Akhenaten. No, in all of Egypt. No, no, in all the world. I will do all that I can to give you all that you've ever wanted, anything that you have ever dreamed. I coaxed him to lean over me so that I could kiss him. I took his face in my hands and smiled up at him. 
You have already done those things, Akhenaten. You already have. It was what he wanted. It was what we wanted. The name Smenkare sat heavily on my mind. Would this be it? Would this child be it? Would we finally have our crown prince? These were only some of the thoughts that were suddenly interrupted as Agtapayatin rushed over to me and began to poke at my belly with her little index finger. Baby! Yes, that's right, Akhenaten replied behind her as I chuckled. There's a baby in there. See? See? See, baby? She asked. No, you can't see the baby yet, Aksapayatin, he chuckled. Wanna see the baby, Daddy? The baby won't be here for a few more months, sweetie. Wanna see the baby? She then paused. When she's ready. How cute. We gave gentle laughs at her alluring innocence. It was something that I hated to see my children outgrow. The palace is getting crowded, Meridotten teased. I think we need some more room. For what? Akhenaten asked. For my private wing. Dream on, Meridotten, Meridotten snubbed. Now, now, Akhenaten interrupted, diffusing a fight before one could occur. In time, you may very well get a whole wing to yourself. That sounds like an ambition, T laughed as she came to join us. In comes Grandma, I announced. Behold her power. Unruly children flock to her in clusters and are rewarded with magical tribute. Thank you, thank you, T replied, bowing graciously. Akhenaten let out a sigh, wiping his face. Ugh, I'm forever doomed to endure the drama that is the gaggle of girls that I keep. I had planned on coming to bestow gifts upon my beautiful grandchildren. But alas, a crocodile has gobbled them up. Such a tragedy. A crocodile didn't eat them, Mechadot deduced and laughed. How do you know I'm fitting, midget? I'm not a midget. There aren't any crocodiles inside the gates of Akhenaten, Meridotten chimed in, sticking out her tongue. Presents? Oxenpayotin perked, as if to add to the chorus of pleas. Nefneferuten giggled and cooed wordlessly. Grandma sure was popular today and was always able to create a stirring in the house in her presence. You're going about your daily duties of spoiling the children, I see, Akhenaten stated good-naturedly. I'm a grandmother, she announced. This is my job. Grandmothers before me have done it, and grandmothers of the times yet to come will continue to do it. Grand will be the day when you do it, Nefertiti. And my son will grow to be an old cranky man with a big gut. Mother? He's gotten a head start then, I laughed. He's always had a bit of a gut. Nefertiti! Anyway, T said, taking command of the conversation yet again. It is integral that I shower them with useless junk. How else am I supposed to properly corrupt them and bend them to my wills? It is the law that they must love me most. She was able to draw a bout of laughter from us on that one. She had always made it a point to be an ever-present grandmother. She wasn't really able to hover over Akhenaten as she once did, and her daughters were quite independent in their own rights. Even little Bekadatan needed little of her time only even interacting with us during the lessons Meridotten attended. Otherwise, she seemed rather eager to go about doing her own little things. The girls received nice little gifts. They weren't much, but they were children after all, and had little use for extravagant things at this stage in their lives. Meridotten received a lovely necklace, of which she adorned immediately. Mikadotten received a toy in the shape of a small cat. Oxenpayotten received her first pair of sandals, which perhaps was the most complex of the gifts. Being as children that young didn't normally wear sandals. Nevertheless, it was a real milestone for her. A new blanket had been made and purchased for Nefernefrotin, along with a second one of a different nature for the eagerly expected. T was even gracious enough to spoil us from time to time. I received a beautiful gold bracelet. To her son, she bestowed a bottle, this was some bottle, and the look on his face showed he was highly confused by it. It was blue, and in the shape of a fish, the puckered lips being the opening of the vessel. If anything, it was a real queer novelty. That's a weird present, Meridotten remarked. Aksimpiyatin giggled and began to imitate the fish face, sucking in her cheeks and puckering up her lips. 
This was quite amusing, not only to us, but to her sisters as well. Don't do that, Akhtabayatin, Akhenaten warned with a gentle chuckle. Your face might freeze like that. He's right, Meridaten chimed in. How do you think Mekadaten got so ugly? Mekadaten cast Meridaten a venomous stare. The moment grew rather tense. A fight would surely break out any moment. But to our surprise, Mekadaten began to laugh. Ugly is learned, and I learned it from my sister. Ouch, Meridaten whispered. That was rather witty. I gave my head a little shake, rising to my feet, and leaving Akhenaten to play with his daughters. I wanted some fresh air and chose to retreat to the quiet royal garden. T followed, though I didn't ask her to. I didn't object to the matter either. I enjoyed her company. But her silence was always something that made me shudder from time to time, and I could feel her eyes looking me over carefully. What are you thinking? What do you mean? I asked. You seem rather solemn. What's bothering you? I lowered my gaze shamefully. T, I want a son. Oh, she smirked. I thought you didn't care. Well, I don't, but... Don't lie to me, she warned. It matters a little. I mean, on the one hand, it would be nice to have a little boy for a change, since I've only had experience with my girls. Don't get me wrong, though. I love my girls very much. But all of that aside... This whole thing is rooted so deeply in politics, she interrupted, finishing my sentence for me. You know that she is coming. Maternity aside, you want a son to call a prince before she arrives, so that she will be of no use and be sent to Memphis. It's not fair, I complained. I cannot and I, we are one. I don't want to share him. He's been mine alone for so long, T. Maybe you'll get lucky. I frowned. Why do your words seem so cold and empty? That would be... Because they are. I worked hard for Akhenaten. I don't want her to come. I don't want to give him up. I understand those feelings, Nefertiti. I felt that way throughout my entire marriage. But there are things we cannot help when we are brought into a royal family. I hated every bride, old and new. They were my rivals. To cut the wound deeper, many of them were princesses and daughters of nobles and ambassadors. They held such high political status and ranks, even without being married to Pharaoh. I was a mere common peasant girl and had not a flame to shine to them. But the fact has, does, and will always remain. Kings have harems. Hate it all you want, but you have to come around and accept it at some point. You can't remain shrouded by your fairy tale fantasies anymore. So you approve of this, even after everything you have told me back in Memphis? As a mother, no, I do not. It hurts to see such things, especially when I know how it feels and know how it eats up a heart inside. I don't want the pain that I had to endure, that my mother-in-law had to endure, and so on back and so on with you and beyond to endure. As a person, a former wife and a mother, I hate it, but as a queen, I do approve of it. Queen of Egypt isn't just some title you can fling about carelessly. Queen of Egypt is the most powerful political position a woman can hold. Her heart lies with the good of Egypt, despite her personal feelings. Egypt and Pharaoh came first, and must always come first. Make Pharaoh's decisions binding and strong. Provide the best laws and opinions for the common folk, and nobles, appease your gods so they do not strike down Pharaoh. And you are obligated to provide Pharaoh either with an heir or for a princess to wed to a lesser son who shall be his heir. If you cannot bear him a son, Nefertiti, it is your duty to encourage him to fulfill his duty by producing one with another wife, or countless, so that Egypt always remains in his dynasty. The longer the dynasty remains, the more glorious the bloodline. You must realize then that you should prime your princesses to take their place in this political threshold and prepare them to wed a lesser son and offer him a place of validity on a throne you could not fill. She paused a moment, trying to calm herself. I truly hope that a son is yours. But know this and take ease. You can never be erased. 
Is this not the destiny of a failed queen, T? Would I be forgotten and thrown from my holy place if she does what I cannot? Huff, she replied. Even if he takes a new bride and fathers a son, that son is still born of a harem wife. And without your daughters, that son cannot hope to achieve a valid claim to the throne that would appease the gods. God. I cannot believe that, like him, you were born of a divine birth. Aten favors you, does it not? It does, but sex and love are not synonymous with man, dear. That's how they are able to maintain vast harems and still have a great wife of which to adore. Akhenaten could have a million wives, and he could very well have sex with every last one of them. They'd be able to brag about his penis, but his heart would always lie with you. And it is to and of you that his words of love would ring true. I just don't understand why, I insisted. The minds of men and women differ in Efertiti. Besides, the ambassador is a very powerful man. He can't overpower Egypt. But holding trade and keeping alliances is a very wise thing to do. Trades of this sort had been made for years. He was a friend of Amenhotep and wished to help when it looked like Akhenaten was having trouble with his familial affairs. He forced it on him. It's a helpful tactic. But it's also a political alliance and the ambassador would gain greatly to have his blood connected to the throne. Refusing her would be horrible for Akhenaten's image. Whether you choose to see it or not, he is growing rather unpopular with our outlying allies. I admire his diplomacy. He had his time to play carelessly as a monogamous family man. Now it is time for him to realize what is expected of him as king of Egypt. He has to realize that, despite what commoners think, being pharaoh does not mean that he can always do as he pleases. He can't have his way all the time. Pharaoh is a virtual god, but still in the body of a man. He is a leader, and the job of a leader is to give his people what is best for them. I looked away, feeling my heart aching as I let her words sink into my mind. I wanted so badly to not hear them, but it would do no good to ignore her. Life is hard, T continued. Kingship is hard. Not just anyone can do it. That's why kings receive such reverence. They must be the very heartbeat and mind of the country over which they rule. You are one woman, but Egypt is many. Hate it as much as you please. But it is something that neither you nor I could ever hope to change. Love is a nice notion. But you must remember that politics are the very blood, diplomacy, and success. See it. Live it and hate it. It is out of your hands. Mine, Akhenaten's, even your children. No one can erase the facts, not even Aten or Amun. Some things are beheld that are more powerful than gods. Suck it up and accept it in bitterness. The acceptance of this lesser queen, this harem whore, whatever one would wish to call her, was for your benefit as well as for the future of Akhenaten. Akhenaten and Egypt. Hate it if you will, but dare not you be selfish. I frowned, almost wanting to cry. Those were such horrible and hurtful words. To add insult to injury, they came not from I, but from Queen T. Was I truly being a selfish queen? It was then I almost wished for that normal existence again, to give up all of this to live in some peaceful exile and blissful happiness. I wanted to live off a self-sufficient land where we could love our daughters without expecting anything political to come from them. I wanted to live off the fruits of the land to eat the bounty that came from Aten's blessed fingers. But this would be unheard of and impractical. Akhenaten was king and there was nowhere to go from here as things stood. We would be forced to endure the bad and miserable along with the good and exquisite. But, as he had said, I could hate it bitterly. I wanted to be the only one. Every queen does, Nefertiti, she replied. In a way, you always will be. Be smart and be strong. It will do you no good to stay angry. Do for you, but do not fault him on this matter. It cannot be helped. I nodded. It makes me sick. It'll pass. The worst of it will be that you must be present at her arrival and see the initiation from guest to bride. 
You will have to look at her cute and perky body and look into her face. Soon, you will see nothing. You do not see them. It will make life more bearable for you. But do not fret over this matter anymore now. You still have time. She is only Meridotten's age, after all. And if it comes down to it, he promised he would get her pregnant. Once. He is only obligated to once. My son is a girl machine. We both are very aware of this. Despite my misery, I had to smile at that bit of realization. It was true. He had only promised to get her pregnant once. Thank you, T. I honestly don't know what I would ever do without you. You are the sturdiest of walls in our lives, minds, and in our hearts. If it weren't for me, Nefertiti, she chuckled, you'd still be back with those harem wives.